All right. So, I guess as we get started, the a couple of things I've, yeah, as you, you saw the quizzes, most of those are updated. Um, you should have your actual quiz back in the feedback area, like the, the PDF. I scanned in all the paper ones from quiz seven. Quiz eight, um, most of those are back. There are a couple that were not in PDF format, um, so they ended up in a different spot. So I have to convert those and, and finish grading those, please. Or um, finish grading those still. And uh, please get quiz nine in when you get a chance. I saw a couple good annotated bibliographies in there for the final project. So um, nice job with those. Thank you. And um, what else is coming in? Oh, and some lab notebooks. A couple have been submitted. Uh, please get those in as soon as you can. Um, thanks. All right. Before we get started on new stuff, is uh, are there any questions or uh, things that you're having issues with with the homework uh, or with this chapter in general that we could talk about? I'll take that as a no. Okay. We'll just jump in at the chat. I've got it up here. So if you have questions, um, Type them in or, or turn on your mic and go ahead and ask. Otherwise, we will be uh, continuing on in this chapter talking about uh, alcohols today. We're going to talk about, uh, or so to review a little bit from last time, we talked about some reactions of alcohols. And the main thing we, the main things we discussed are one, that alcohols are poor leaving groups um, and that they need to be protonated generally if they're gonna do substitution and elimination chemistry. We saw some examples of those. Um, yes, some more examples of the long reactions. I assume you mean the synthesis plans where you have to like figure out what to do each step. Yeah, yeah we'll do more of that too. Um, as we keep adding more reactions that we know, we have more capabilities of those kinds of things that we can do. Um, so, all right, so alcohols can do some SN1 or SN, SN2, E1, E2 type chemistry, but it has to be in particular conditions because they're poor leaving groups. We also looked at conversions of alcohols to chloride. That's going to be really useful when we need leaving groups and, and that sort of thing. And then we looked at oxidation of alcohols where we can turn alcohols into carboxylic acids with chromic acid. We can also turn them, primary alcohols, turn them into aldehydes with PCC, pyridinium chlorochromate. And then either of those work on secondary alcohols also to become ketones. All right. And then of course we use those in a lot of these synthesis plans where we have to figure out how to build this whole molecule from these reactions. Um, so we'll be doing more of that. Also, uh, we're going to look at a couple other classes of molecules from chapter eight first, and then we'll put all that together. So um, first, let's see how I can do this. Let's take a look at ethers. Um, so we have seen some ethers before. If you remember, we define an ether as just an oxygen in between two carbon things. R, remember, can be kind of like a wild card for carbon stuff. And then we say R and R prime just to indicate that those don't necessarily have to be the same. They can be two totally different things. So some ethers that we've seen so far are like this one. is diethyl ether. That's what we've seen in, uh, that's what we use in lab. Remember in the um, silver bottle, the really volatile kind of explosive stuff. Um, that's diethyl ether, really common 
lab solvent. And it's so common that it's often just referred to as ether, even though ethers are a whole class of compounds. Uh, but we can sometimes just refer to that as ether. Um, so one thing that we're going to say about ethers, when we name ethers, as you can see, if, if the ether is the most important part of the molecule like this, then you just kind of say what's on each side, and that becomes the name of the ether. So let's say we had a methyl group on one side, an ethyl group on the other side. All right, this could be methyl, ethyl ether, or ethyl methyl ether. Um, Okay, so you got a methyl on one side, ethyl on the other side, so methyl ethyl, methyl, ethyl ether. Um, it's kind of a tongue twister. So uh, that's that's ethers. We are we're not really going to look at reactions of these types of ethers because they're really not that reactive, um, and, and that's kind of what the book says. There are some generally they are not. Um, they're not very reactive, so we're not going to look at reactions of them. We will look at how to form ethers because we've already really done that. Um, generally, we'll form ethers through substitution reactions with oxygen nucleophiles. So things like methoxy, whatever, isopropoxide, whatever you want to make your ether out of, um, you can do that. So you, you might imagine uh, if we wanted to come up with a synthetic plan for Okay, how do we make methyl ethyl ether from, let's say, um, bromoethane? All right, we could add um, some sodium methoxide. Fusion reaction, and then end up with something like that. So. Um, that's all. That's all. I really, need to talk about with ethers. Ethers because they don't have OH have much much lower boiling points. That's why, like the ether we used in lab, is so volatile, um, evaporates so easily, forms vapor so easily, because it um, it really acts. Even though it's polar, it really acts more like uh, a nonpolar um, entity in a lot of respects. It has some polarity. It has some better water solubility than something that's totally nonpolar. Excuse me. But um, <clears throat> but still, it can't hydrogen bond, really. So there is one special class of ether that I want to talk about, and that does do some interesting and useful reactions, and that is epoxides. So epoxides are a three-membered cyclic ether. So it looks like this. So a three-membered ring with two carbons and an oxygen. It's called an epoxide. Epoxides are really important intermediates in synthesis. They're also natural products. They're naturally occurring. Um, and they're used in a lot a lot of different applications because they have a really nice combination of stability and reactivity. So you can make them fairly easily, and then you can also react them fairly easily because as we've talked about before, a three-membered ring is going to have a lot of angle strain. We know that a um, that a, a ideal tetrahedral angle is about 110 degrees, and a triangle has a 60 degree angle if it's an equilateral triangle. So that's a big difference in angle. So these things are really squeezed, which means they want to open up or they're, they're very um, uh, easily able to, to react and get those things open back up. So, um, so we're gonna talk a couple, a little bit about how to make them and then what we actually do with them and how they can be useful. So first to make them, um, epoxides uh, 
Epoxides are made from alkenes. So you can take an alkene as a starting material, which is good because we know some ways to make alkenes. So we're thinking, yeah. And then we're gonna um, react it with something called a per acid or a per um, a peroxy acid, which is basically a carboxylic acid with an extra oxygen in it. So our normal carboxylic acid would be OH here. And with R, we're just saying some acid. We're not specifying which one. But we're actually going to add another OH here. Or, uh, sorry, another O here. So there's an extra oxygen in there. And that makes it highly um, oxidizing and can form this epoxide. Um, I don't think the book actually goes into the mechanism of how that's formed. I can show you if you're interested, or you can look it up in a, in a different textbook. Um, but if you do that kind of a reaction, oh, hold on a second, my dog is caught on the cords here. My dog is very old. She gets stuck and she can't really see or hear, so I have to help her out a lot. Um, Okay, uh, so where were we? Oh yeah, the epoxides here. So that's going to form the epoxide. Now, if you think about, um, this would be easier if we had bottles, but the that really strained ring, if you think about that, it's like just can't see the whole picture. Uh, you mean what I'm writing? Uh, the left side. You can't see the left side. Can you maximize your meeting window? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have like the chat panels and stuff showing? I assume since you're typing them. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't actually have to close the chat. Let me see if I can show you this. Um, there should be an option in WebEx in like the upper right hand corner somewhere where you can um, you can pop out the windows. There's like a little circle and you can change how the windows are set up. And if you pop out the chat window and allow the other thing to take up the whole screen, you should see the whole thing. Um, I, I can't find where mine went here. Uh, let's see. Um, so there's like a couple little circular buttons that look like this. And you want to go to like pop out panels. They're in the upper right hand corner, little circular buttons. Let me see if I can, I don't, know if, I don't think I can bring it over into the, into where I'm sharing the screen. So Arena, how did you fix yours? Did it just happen or did you do something? Okay, just maximize the window. Yeah, it has to do, it also has to do with like the size of your screen, I think, um, how much space you've got. The, but, but if, you, if you should have these little circular buttons in the upper right that you can change the view. And if you pop the panels out, you can get it to take up the whole screen better. Um, I can also try to not write uh, over on the left quite as far. I help too. All right. So one thing I want to um, I want you to see here is that I'm drawing this with a little bit of um, not stereochemistry, but just three dimensionality shown here. This is not a this is not chiral, um, but what we do see 
is that the epoxide can only form on one side of the ring, either above or below, because it's that uh, three-membered ring, which is very, um, very strained. And if you imagine, I, I wish we, I wish I had a model here to show you. Um, I don't have any in my house, but if you imagine a cyclohexane, and then you're going to put the epoxide bond on there. In fact, let's see if we can draw it in three dimensions. So imagine you have a um, cyclohexane like this, a chair conformation. And let's say we want to put an epoxide off of this bond here. So if we draw our substituents out here, it's, it's going to likely be too strained. Because remember, we have to just put one atom here. We're not going to be able to have something going down and up with the same atom on it. So when we put, when we put that epoxide in, in there, we end up with something more like this. So this, this other substituent actually ends up kind of going out kind of this way. But you can see how strained that is and how it's like it's even hard to kind of draw it properly. Um, so the point of that is it has to go on one side. So the, so the epoxide has to, both sides of it have to be on, on either the top or the bottom. You can't have like a trans epoxide. Um, and so because of that, you have introduced a little bit of stereochemistry, uh, much like the adding the dibromine to the double bond that we saw before. So you can end up having some uh, stereo selectivity in your products when you have reactions with epoxides. And in fact, in fact, the idea of asymmetric epoxidation, where you're forming an epoxide preferentially on one side or the other, was a huge, huge breakthrough in organic chemistry um, in the way that you could target specific stereoisomers and ended up winning the prize for that work. All right, so there are a couple of reagents um, that are commonly used with this. It looks like the book uh, doesn't really specify them. But I want to show you a couple just in case you see them elsewhere. So a simple, uh, a simple one would be per acetic acid, like that. Okay, so you may see that uh, forming epoxides. And then there's another one that actually works really well. Uh, and so it's used, even though it's a little bit more elaborate of a structure. And the, the full name of this is metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, uh, but it's more commonly known as MCPBA. So if you see that, especially if you're looking in places that aren't our book, this is a really common reagent. Uh, that's used for epoxidation, so making an epoxide. So um, if you have some practice problems on other websites or you're looking for some uh, additional help or, or something like that, that may be more common. Um, that, that's a commonly used peroxy acid for epoxidation. Okay, so now we've made our epoxides. So let's look at re the reactions of these epoxides. Really stretching my computer's cable. Kind of slowing down. Um, okay. Sorry, just give me a second to try to.
Right, well, we'll see. We'll see what we can do here. Um, all right, so reactions of epoxides. Generally, what's going to happen here is that the epoxide that's formed can then open up. Um, so a, a nucleophile of some sort can attack one side of the epoxide, opening it up um, to the other side. So let's take a look at, for instance, this epoxide. So if we react to this, I'm going to try to color code this a little bit so that we can see the difference. So we're going to react this with water with an acid catalyst. So we could also just call this H3O plus. Right? We've done that before, water with an acid catalyst. And so what's going to happen is the water is going to attack on one side, either side, and kind of open this thing up so that you end up with a diol, a dialcohol, an alcohol on, it, on each side. Um, so let's say the water, and we're gonna look at the mechanism in a second, but let's say the water attacks up here at the top. So that means that this oxygen that was in the original structure is going to be down over here. And the OH that comes from the um, alcohol has to attack on the opposite side. So you end up with a trans diol like that. Um, and in fact, you, you get this uh, plus, plus the enantiomer. So this oxygen is coming from the epoxide. This oxygen is coming in from the, uh, from the water. So let's look at that mechanistically and see how that works. You'll notice it's very similar to substitution chemistry, which is good. It means we don't have to learn a whole new thing. So let's take our epoxide again. And I'm actually going to leave the hydrogens off. I'm, I'm, they're there. I'm just not going to show them uh, just for ease of drawing the mechanism. So there's our epoxide. And then let's take our hydronium, our acid and water. OK, and we can protonate the epoxide as a first step. Remember, in general, any time something's happening in acid, especially an acid catalyst type thing. But really, anytime something's happening in acid, there's a good chance that the very first mechanistic step is protonation. Because that's what acids do, right? If you're in strong acid and you have any kind of neutral basic type site, like a lone pair anywhere or an alkene or whatever, chances are you're going to protonate that first. And, and go back and look at all the mechanisms we've seen so far. In acid, they're always that way. It's always, we're always protonating uh, first. All right, so that gives us a protonated epoxide. And water. So then water can come in and do really an SN2 type mechanism on that carbon of the epoxide right here. So releasing that epoxide up like that. Okay, this is getting bad. I gotta. 
figure out some way to speed this thing up. That seems a little better. All right, so I've got the OH here, um, and then this water is going to end up attached over here on the back, so behind. Right, you see that? So uh, the OH being, or this being behind, then the final step is going to be our. Um, just just neutralizing everything, which we usually just do with, we say that there's some other base or some other water hanging around there that can deprotonate this to give us our final product. Okay, so there's our diol that came from the epoxide. And uh, the name of this type of a reaction is it my back? Okay. The name of this type of reaction would be Catalyzed epoxide ring opening. All right. So then I sorry. Okay. Um so the other thing that makes epoxides really useful is that you can kind of control the regioselectivity when you don't have a um when you don't have a symmetric epoxide. So let's take a look at this epoxide, which is uh, an example from the book. And we're going to also look at, at a, a corollary, which is base catalyzed. So let's say we have this type of epoxide, kind of like before. But instead of just a symmetric one around the ring like that, we have a um, actually like a, a different structure where we have a methyl group attached to the carbon on this side and not on this side. So definitely a different situation there. When we have something like this, so now we have different possible products depending on which side the nucleophile attacks on. If the nucleophile attacks on this side, then you've got um, you know, one, one product. If it attacks on this side, you've got a different product. Um, this is especially true if we have a non-OH type nucleophile. So let's take a look at like what would happen if instead we used ammonia, NH3. So now instead of an acid catalyzed uh, ring opening, we're going to have a base, it's not really base catalyzed, but we have basic conditions. Um, and so the epoxide actually does not need to be protonated first if we're in basic conditions, because you can't really have protonated stuff when there's base around or the base is just going to deprotonate it. Um, so instead, the ammonia is going to attack directly. And if you notice, there's two different possible spots. It could either attack the top side or the bottom side, and those are going to lead to two different products. So as it turns out, the bottom side here is favored because there is less steric hindrance around that carbon. So this extra methyl group makes this spot very crowded and this spot less crowded. 
And so that's more likely where the, um, where the ammonia is going to attack. And so depending on how big the nucleophile is, that could potentially be a really a very strong regioselectivity or not so strong regioselectivity um, depending on the, the particular structure. But we know that cyclohexanes are fairly sterically hindered anyway. They've got, you know, the various substitutions coming out. They've got the chair conformation. So it, there's definitely likely, since the thing has to be coming in from the bottom, that that uh, nucleophile is going to go to the more open site. So that means that this time the oxygen will end up over here. And it's negatively detached without being protonated first. The ammonia is going to end up here. And then we're going to take a couple steps to protonate and then deprotonate um, the, this thing, so hydrogen transfer. Uh, so this is where it can be really useful to just use a generic B for base, because we don't exactly what's happening, but we know that some hydrogens have to get transferred around. Um, so let's say we take our B and we deprotonate this. And then we can protonate the oxygen so that we end up with a neutral product overall. So there's our OH and hopefully not block this. And then the NH2. Okay, so that would be basic in basic conditions. That's what a epoxide ring opening would look like. And we have to remember that the nucleophile is generally going to go to the less sterically hindered spot. Now let's take this same substrate and think about it in acid again. But something else kind of interesting happens here. If we're in acidic conditions, then we expect the first step again to be that protonation. So like that. But now look what's happening. Um, we now have something that's very similar to our dehydration or um, SN1 type reactions from earlier because we have basically this excellent leaving group right here connected to a tertiary carbon. Right, there's a tertiary carbon there. So we would expect now not to have that alcohol or water attack right away. We would actually expect this thing to detach first. So this is actually going to do like SN1 type chemistry and pull itself off first because of that tertiary carbon and actually leave us with a carbocation here. And so 
So if that happens, that may actually completely mess up our whole stereo selective thing that we were talking about, um, because that water could then attack on either side. It really all depends at this point how easily and quickly that can detach, whether or not we're going to destroy that, that stereochemistry. So that's something to watch, um, because now that water can come in here, either on the top or the bottom, and, and give us those, those products. So this is what we would expect from a standard epoxide ring opening. I'm going to give it an extra step here because we need to transfer the hydrogen. Actually, let's not do that. I don't want to confuse. Or we could get the other, we could get the other one also, the other diastereomer. Okay. So that is epoxide ring opening. And so depending on the um, on the nucleophile that you use, you can get some of that selectivity and you can make some some interesting products. Um, for example, this particular one in the book. Uh, so you can see here the um, here's our epoxide, and here are three different nucleophiles, two of which we've we've looked at already, and then also you could use the sulfur nucleophile. But depending on the nucleophile, you can make all those different products where you have um, two carbons, the alcohol one, and then whatever else somewhere else. We use this term beta to mean like. Uh, one more carbon, two carbons away. So alpha is one carbon away, beta is two carbons away. So uh, this is saying that this is an, a beta amino alcohol means that the amine is two carbons away from the alcohol. Um, same thing over here, a beta mercapto alcohol, that's that SH that's two carbons away from the alcohol. So if you need to make, if we think again about those syntheses and about planning out how we're going to build those molecules, um, when you have, if you want to put something two carbons away from an alcohol, then you start thinking, okay, I must have to use some epoxide chemistry here. I can use some epoxide chemistry. Maybe epoxide chemistry would be a good way to get this thing two carbons away from the alcohol. That's what I'm going for. Questions about that? So we will um, we'll, we'll try some of these out in the synthesis plan, but first let's finish up the rest of the reactions in the chapter. There's really just uh, one more small thing to look at, and that is thiols. Oh no, what did I do? Do more uh, paper now. Thiols are, have very similar chemistry to alcohols. Thiols are SH. Okay. An older name for thiols that you'll sometimes see is mercaptan. Uh, that stands for mercury capture because thiol, sulfur in general, reacts very strongly with mercury. Uh, so you can make you can 
use thiols to get mercury out of thiols also smell extremely bad um, a lot of the bad a lot of the things that we think of as bad smells are mercaptans uh, so rotten rotten egg kind of smells um, you know fart poop kind of smells that's all mercaptans um, that's not the bad smells from uh, like like decomposing flesh and stuff like that is uh, is more amines, but those kind of like poopier bad smells are generally mercaptans or thiols, um, kind of unpleasant stuff. So um, they're they're named and and treated much like alcohols. So if you have something like This, this would be ethane thiol. So you just say thiol at the end of whatever. Something like this would be two methyl. One propane thiol. So a couple of things about thiols that we've that we've kind of touched on already. Sulfur is much bigger than oxygen. That makes it uh, what we say more polarizable, which means that it's has less charge density. So when it's when when we talk about the sulfur lone pairs, or we talk about the negative charge on sulfur. If it's negatively charged, that's a much more stable charge. So sulfur is much more nucleophilic than oxygen um, because oxygen is more basic. So it, it's a little sometimes a little bit counterintuitive because you think, oh, oxygen is the stronger base. It's going to be the stronger nucleophile. It's actually not true. It's the opposite. Um, sulfur is the better nucleophile. And we've seen that in some of the examples where like basically whenever you saw sulfur being used in a substitution reaction, it's always pretty much SN2. Um, I think the ones we've seen generally, because again, it's just such a strong nucleophile, it's going to have a really quick SN2 rate. So in terms of reactions of thiols or making thiols, um, one thing is that thiols are much stronger acids than alcohols. So something like ethane thiol has a pKa of 8.5, whereas if you remember, ethanol has a pKa of like 16. And that, again, shows how much more stable the charge conjugate base of this, much more stable than the conjugate base of ethanol, which would be ethoxide. Um, so that's one thing that, that we know about thiols. In terms of reactions, it's going to be substitution chemistry. SN2 chemistry, whatever, that, that's how we're going to make thiol. There are other reagents that you can use to make thiols, but that's what we're going to focus on. And then another important um, reaction of sulfides is that they can be um, oxidized to something called disulfides, which are Just two sulfurs connected like that. Um, disulfide bonds can actually be um, fairly easily just oxidized by oxygen itself. So um, you can have something like like this, and you can take two of those and react it with oxygen. and make disulfides. Um, the reason that that's important that we look at that is disulfide bonds are, um, I don't know if we'll get to it this semester, but they're really important in protein chemistry. There are several amino acids that have uh, thiols in them, that have SH in them. And those amino acids can be linked together through disulfide bonds. So the disulfide bonds are one of the things that lead to protein structure that causes 
uh, the um, the tertiary structure of proteins, how they kind of like pack together, how they fold together. If you've heard about like protein folding, disol bonds are a big part of that. They're fairly labile, which means they can be broken and formed pretty easily. They're not super strong. Um, and so that that is a way that proteins can fold and unfold. If you um, ever deal with like hair treatments, like um, perms and stuff like that, uh, straightening chemicals, things like that, that's usually has something to do with forming or breaking disulfide bonds in the protein in the hair that's causing it to um, to take on different shapes that way. So like it's a little bit more permanent than just you know hairspray or something, but it still will uh, come out over time as those bonds break and reform. All right, so that's all the kind of new reactions in chapter eight. So for the last bit uh, here, let's take a look at some of those, as you said, big reactions again. So these synthesis plans, these ways that we can plan out how we're going to make something. Um, that, uh, that might be much bigger than where we started. Okay, so here's one. Notice we have a cycloheptane here instead of cyclohexane. All right, so here's the transformation we're looking for to go from a chloride to a um, diol, a trans diol. So take a, take a minute or two and see if you can come up with some sort of a plan. Now remember, at this point, especially, I don't care if you can like list the specific reactions in exactly the order to make it work, but I want you to come up with some sort of a plan of how would you do this? How could you get this to work? What kinds of reactions are you gonna look at and then we can always look up the specific reagents or, um, or think about that further. But take a couple minutes and see if you can come up with a plan, just some general ideas of what kinds of things are you going to do to get that transformation to work. Ideas yet? I think, like, what's one type of reaction that you might need for this transformation? Anybody? 
Everybody? Everybody? All right, well, let's, let's take a look. So again, we're going to start from the end. And we're going to work our way backwards and say, what kinds of reactions do we need to make this? What kinds of reactions do we need to make this? And we may not be right on the first try. We're going to try and see. So here I see a trans diol. And to me, that says epoxide. And so we just talked about that a trans diol can be fairly easily made by epoxidation. So we're going to maybe start with an epoxide and then open that up to make this. Um, and that's exactly a reaction that we saw today. So if we imagine just kind of getting our, our plan in place here before we look at all the specific reagents, we know that we can make this from epoxide. If we had an epoxide like that, we could open it up with an oxygen or, or um, water nucleophile to do something like that. Okay? The, trans, the, the key to that, or the, re, the thing that shows us that, is that we've got this trans diol. The trans diol, um, we can see that, that that's likely where that's going to come from. So that brings us to the epoxide. Okay. And then we say, well, where do we make epoxides from? Well, there's really only one way that we've learned to make epoxides, and that's from uh, alkenes. So if we're going to have an epoxide, that means that we have to make that from an alkene with some kind of peroxy acid. Alkenes react with peroxy acids to make epoxides. That's it. That's, if, if we need an epoxide, we need to have a peroxy acid. All right. So then, the, um, then we can look a step back and say, okay, well, how do we make alkenes? And specifically, how do we make alkenes from alkyl halides? And the answer is elimination. So we're going to just do some sort of elimination chemistry here. Maybe sodium hydroxide, maybe um, one of those special elimination bases that we said were particularly good for elimination, like potassium terbutoxide, uh, something like that. Just some kind of strong base that we can do elimination, form the alkene, and then we can make the epoxide from that. So questions about that or about, about that logic? So there's actually another answer here that works. Um, so maybe let, let's look at a totally different, totally different route. Maybe you saw this trans um, stereochemistry here and thought, oh, that kind of reminds me of bromine um, with like how we can bromine. So maybe we can make this from oops, wrong ring, sorry. Maybe we can make this like from a, um, a bromination product through substitution chemistry. Maybe if we just like heat this up with some water, we can get substitution chemistry going on here. Now, this is not maybe a great reaction. You would maybe also want to do this in some sort of aprotic solvent to try to minimize carbocation formation, because you're probably going to get some E1 and SN1 stuff otherwise. Um, so like practically in the lab, this is not as good of a solution. But on paper, we can say it's, it's all right. Um, let's, so let's say we start with that. And then we'd say, OK, well, we get that from an alkene also. And then we get the alkene from the original 
thing through elimination. So those, those first couple steps end up being kind of the same. Right? We eliminate to form the alkene, ruminate, and then substitute, as opposed to eliminating epoxidation and then opening uh, and then ring opening. So this is definitely like a, a better solution because it's more well suited toward the product and it's gonna have better yields and stuff. But for our purposes, this is also reasonable and I think I think would work too. So there's always gonna be some different possible answers. The key is that you think about each step, what does this make or, or what can I, how, how, what do I make this thing from? Um, and then going from there. And then the thing here is, when you're doing these synthetic transformations, these are always going to use reactions that we've studied in class that we know work for these particular substrates. So, you know, don't like just guess some random reagent that may or may not have anything to do with anything we've talked about. Um, it, you may get lucky and it may work, but submit that on a question. I'm going to look, if I don't know offhand how that works, I'm going to look it up. And if you don't have a reference for that actually working that way, it's not right. Um, so if you're getting in a situation where it seems like you have to use something that you've never heard of or that we've never talked about, chances are you're not on the right route and you should go back and check again and, and maybe try something else. All right. Um, any, so that's about it for today. Any questions or other things that have come up? All right, well, I hope you're all um, staying safe and uh, taking care of yourselves and your family. Uh, please let me know if you have more questions. I can stick around here if you have questions. Uh, I'll be here also Wednesday. And you can always email me if, um, if you have additional questions or you want to meet for, to talk for, uh, at different times. Uh, otherwise, I will see you Wednesday morning about the same time. Thanks, everybody. Good day, Steve.